really excited to to be with you guys this evening. Obviously, in difficult times, but uh, as one of our slides says later, you know, you must never you must never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, because you know, when we when we're sitting in this environment, we really don't know what's going to be happening uh, from any minute to minute. Um, there's threats and there's opportunities. I think many organizations are starting to see that there are potential opportunities they can take advantage of and advantage being a very strong word. But at the end of the day, the strong will survive through this um, and hopefully will thrive. And we really want to just share a few thoughts on that this evening. Um, this is not a newscast, uh, even though we have a PowerPoint presentation, this is not a PowerPoint presentation. It's really us just sharing some experiences. We have Jason, uh, Jason is, is sitting in the USA, he's one of our partners. Um, and Jason has been, you know, through, through various uh, 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 tragedies, not necessarily of this scale, but with similar impacts to a large extent on what's happening now. And he'll be able to share some of our thoughts and ideas around, you know, how, how resilient were people in those times and how did they actually survive uh, through that and, and at the end of the day thrive. Um, also have uh, Chad uh, joining us and Chad is, is one of our top uh, agilists. He's, he's most probably the top agilist in, in Africa being a, a SAFE program consultant uh, trainer candidate. Um, and between us, we really, so, when COVID-19, uh, you know, and the, and the lockdown happened, I mean, literally, even ourselves, we're a consulting company. We were fully booked for March, April, and May with consulting projects and, and workshops. And the time Cyril Ramaphosa did his first uh, speech within 24 hours, all of that was actually wiped off the floor uh, for us. So we had, to, we had to pivot. We had to look at it. Obviously, there was, you know, well, what are we going to do? But very quickly we realized that there is ways of, of operating in this new world and they're actually quite exciting and it's probably the the change that has happened has been coming along at us we always talk about VUCA and we always talk about you know digital transformation and you must probably uh, have seen these memes that say you know that uh, who, who brought digital transformation to your company it wasn't your CEO or your CIO it was actually COVID-19 um, because all of a sudden organizations have got to realize how do we operate in this world now that is very quickly pushed many to us, uh, many of us to a digital environment, including us as consulting companies. So, you know, very, very pleased to be with you tonight. Um, and, you know, we're going to, we're going to, when, when we say interactive, we're going to be as interactive as we can on a, on a, uh, on a, on a webinar. We are going to introduce you to some tools that were sent to you. Uh, uh, through the invitation that, that all of you would have received. We'll talk a little bit to those. We're also going to do a, a survey through Mentimeter, uh, which is online. If, if In fact, I'm going to ask Chad to put that into the Q&A section if he can, or if there was an email sent out to you guys beforehand, just to log into that in the interim so that when we actually get to that uh, survey, you know, we don't, we don't spend uh, a lot of time waiting for guys to log into that. But that's just really to see what people are thinking right now. Uh, so there's also the other tools I spoke about. And then it, when the, when the uh, uh, webinar is finished, uh, tomorrow we'll more than likely send all of you a link to a survey that is specifically around COVID-19 and how organizations are and could be reacting to this in various things from strategy to financial to uh, supply chain to employees to community to customer etc um, and we'd, we'd love for you guys to finish that uh, or do that survey for us so that we can then send you a consolidated uh, report on what everybody that participated in the survey what they're doing and how this has worked out so without further ado uh, are we going to we're going to we're going to hand over to Jason to really just talk about the macro uh, impacts of, of, of COVID-19 as well as his experience in the USA of going through things very much through the economic crashes of 2008, 2009. You know, uh, Jason has been vice president for, for some really big organizations in the USA, a very senior, um, you know, a, a professional in, in both business and in consulting. So I think he's really a great person to lead us into this discussion from a macroeconomic perspective as to what we're finding this, this, this new, new world where 
the new, new world we talk about, I think we all know, I think everybody that's on this webinar will have already realized we're not going back to what it used to be like. The world will never be the same again. And it's up to us to make sure that our organizations survive and thrive in this uh, COVID-19 and post-COVID-19 world. Um, so yeah, if I can, I can hand over to Jason and he's just gonna take us through the macroeconomic and, and macro, well, the macro impact of COVID-19. So thanks very much, Jason. Sounds great, Miles. Uh, just to uh, start with a, a quick overview of Be Agile. Uh, we're a South African-based consultancy with the presence also in the US uh, and the UK. Now, our focus is on partnering with organizations to, to deliver both differentiated near-term performance. So we all, rec all recognize that uh, we need to be delivering on the top line and bottom line you know, metrics that the leaders are being held accountable for. But in tandem, we need to be building the key agility and adaptability to thrive in rapidly evolving markets. Uh, I think the, the, the last couple of months have demonstrated the, the need for agility, adaptability, and resilience uh, like no other time we've seen. Uh, we have a ton of partners um, and um, clients across South Africa, across Africa. Um, I haven't included a number of our um, clients in the US, but we're also working with uh, a number of, of clients in the US and also Europe. Uh, we wanted to start out with a, a socioeconomic uh, kind of just a quick overview uh, of COVID-19. Um, this is probably stuff that everyone, that most of you already know, uh, but could put into perspective. Uh, first and foremost, you know, COVID-19 is a human uh, crisis. Uh, I spent most of my career in New York City uh, and have lots of friends who are personally impacted by this. Uh, so this, to, just to put this into perspective, when we created this slide last Thursday, uh, the number of global deaths to date uh, were 85,000. So in less than a week, we've seen over 40,000 deaths across the world uh, due to COVID-19. And we see it obviously, uh, lots of hotspots across the world. I'm grateful to, to hear that uh, those numbers aren't in the same realm. Um, in South Africa and that you guys have been uh, very proactive in managing that. Um, while we you know, establish that this is a, a, a human crisis, um, it's also you know, a, a socioeconomic or macroeconomic uh, crisis. Uh, estimates range, uh, but uh, a conservative estimate would be that we, we've seen, uh, we will see trillion dollar plus impacts due to COVID-19. Latest forecasts are in the kind of two to three t uh, trillion dollars of macroeconomic impact uh, globally. There, the you know, this isn't just a macroeconomic issue. Uh, you know, everyone sees it. Uh, the the challenges around jobs. Um, just to put this into context, to the worst month of unemployment claims um, in the 2008-2009 financial crisis uh, you know, were 800,000 new uh, the unemployment claims. In April, we've already seen over 5 million uh, jobless claims in the United States alone. Uh, that number is actually closer to 6 million as of this week. When we look at it in a South African um, context, um, not quite as bleak. Um, thankfully, you guys have some more labor protection uh, in, in your context. Uh, but forecasts suggest that uh, at a minimum, you know, that over 1,600 companies uh, will will likely go bankrupt uh, in South Africa um, during this period. And to be honest, these these were these numbers are probably a couple of weeks old. Um, it it yeah, unfortunately may be more significant than that when all is said and done. Third, definitely a profound impact on global trade, uh, and South African supply chains are, are not exempted. Uh, the economists are estimating that global trade you know, will be reduced by 13 to almost a third, you know, you know 32 percent um, during this period. And there's been a lot of work uh, done uh, across a number of consultancies around the impact of supply chains. Uh, you know, I think the implications of supply chain strain are being seen today, but they're going to become much more evident in the in the next month or two, uh, particularly as people. Um, go back to work and we start um, producing 
um, all of the kind of slack and inefficiencies in the supply chain, in particularly pockets of supply chain challenges, are going to be, become much, much more evident. Uh, we, we liked the PwC uh, reference here that um, recommends taking a very agile approach to assessing um, any vulnerabilities in your supply chain and being very, very proactive in how you address them. Look, this is going to have a long, uh, kind of long tail implication for the global economy. Uh, we need to be proactive in how we're addressing it, but uh, uh, governments, uh, as they step in, are taking on quite a lot of debt. Now, uh, in the U.S., we're looking at uh, two to potentially three to four trillion dollars of debt uh, at the federal level uh, associated with this, with the response. Uh, there's a lot with all that kind of central money coming in. Uh, there are going to be risks of inflation uh, as uh, the economy um, you know, begins again, people uh, engage in, in trade again. Uh, so keep an eye out uh, on risks associated with inflation, particularly with the, the, you know, the U.S. and the more mature uh, U.S. economies in the U.K. You know, when you see you know, what Italy has done around their response, uh, they've also been... Uh, stimulus spending. Well, there are a number of countries that kind of meet that profile that have quite a lot of macro debt already. Uh, and we're you know, at that verge of having real inflationary kind of uh, currency related challenges. So you know, uh, much to watch there. And finally, that discussion of jobs. Uh, there will be a lot of jobs impacted, uh, millions, uh, if, not, if not tens of millions of jobs around the world. Um, and as we recover and re-engage, um, the, the pace of that recovery in employment um, you know, is uncertain. So uh, the human crisis has to be forefront, but for those of us who um, lead businesses, these are the type of issues that we need to be thinking about from a macroeconomic perspective uh, as we kind of engage and, and um, flesh out our scenario plans. So, we wanted to uh, you know, build in as much interactivity in this discussion as possible. And you know, we're quite interested to understand what's on your mind. Uh, Chad, are, are you on the call? Hey, Jason. Uh, thanks for bringing us to, to the, the uh, survey. I just want to make sure that everybody, if you can just raise your hand and, and let me know if uh, the survey is now open. I just opened it as you went across to the slide. And uh, it should be open and we should start seeing uh, some results popping up. We're going to leave it open for two minutes uh, just to give you the chance to think through this. But effectively, what we're asking is if you had to prioritize what is the most important thing for you to focus on as a business right now, uh, understanding that we've been in lockdown for a couple of weeks and we've got a couple of weeks to go and the challenges aren't going to stop here. So once we... Uh, once we sort of come out the other side, there are going to be significant impacts across a number of areas, not just of our personal lives, um, but also for um, for the people that we uh, that we employ, um, that we support, that we provide uh, product and content for. Uh, so there are many factors to consider. What you can do in order to vote is use your camera and scan that the camera on your phone. If you have an Apple phone, it should pop up a URL immediately. Um, the QR code's in the top right-hand side of the screen. And you can also just go to menti.com and use the code 987012. It sounds like uh, the URL in the Q&A box can't be clicked on. Um, so I'm just going to... See if I can just paste it again, if you're having trouble um, getting to it. And uh, you should be able to access that. I'm not sure whether Zoom webinar prevents you from clicking on any links or not. So Jason, do you want to just give us, if you can solve on the left, left hand side of the screen and just give us that countdown and see if you can just give a minute countdown um, if that that's all working for us. And uh, just one minute and then um, the voting is going to close. What we're going to be doing with the results from the survey is, is obviously it's going to be guiding 
some of the conversation going forward. Uh, but Miles did mention earlier when he kicked us off that there will be some feedback and, and some, uh, some more uh, collateral that's going to be coming to you guys that have attended the session. We're going to include a summary of this report and also probably point you to a couple of the canvases and tools that we have at our, our disposal uh, to make it easier to answer some of these questions. I see the I see the results are coming in. There's 16 so far, 17 coming in. That's great. Thank you so much. And it looks like currently uh, cash flow and finances is a, is leading it with operations and customers um, playing a close second. And uh, and of course, let's not forget about our staff and the employees. So we've got the second left, and the voting is closed with 19 responses. Thanks, Jason. I'm going to hand back over to you. Yeah, sounds good. Um, you know, glad to see um, that uh, folks were able to participate and glad to see the responses because that um, you know, echoes what we've seen elsewhere. And we'll talk about um, all of the all of the top um, issues throughout the, uh, you know, the rest of this presentation. Um, let me just remind myself the next section. All right. Uh, so I wanted to share with you guys uh, just some observations from a couple of large-scale business disruptions that um, that I've been involved with uh, over the last 20 years. Um, fortunately, unfortunately, uh, I've, I've had a, a little bit of experience with this personally. Uh, and the things that we walked away from, those of us who uh, were at 9-11 uh, and uh, we went through Hurricane Sandy, um, both in New York City, um, different decades, um, but um, both caused uh, multi-month outages um, in our and being able to work um, you know, in our offices. Um, so let me just give you a little bit of context. Um, my office uh, in 2001 uh, was two blocks away um, from the World Trade Center. Uh, I worked in the, the Chase Manhattan Corporate Center uh, there. And uh, when 9-11 occurred, uh, there was quite a lot of damage. Um, so all of us ended up working remotely for three to four months. Uh, and then in 2012, I ran board reporting for transformation for AIG. And our corporate headquarters and largest uh, corporate footprint was unfortunately on Water Street uh, in lower Manhattan. And it's, it's generally not a good idea, uh, or it's not a good thing when your corporate headquarters is on Water Street in the middle of a hurricane. And so we had about 20 feet of water uh, in the corporate headquarters. And again, uh, we were displayed for about three months and, and the leadership team and, and um, all the workers in the uh, corporate headquarters had to work remotely during that period. So these are, let me just share with you some things that, um, that I reflect on as I look um, back at those multi-month business disruptions. The first is uh, people are tremendously resilient. I think we see it today. Uh, as people uh, change, they pivot, they figure out how to engage, figure out how to solve problems. Uh, it is, it, it's, a, it's an opportunity for people to come together uh, and to collectively um, engage to, to deliver value for our customers and continue to move our agenda forward. Um, that doesn't mean that there isn't a personal impact. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes, but uh, it is remarkable. Um, how folks, uh, how resilient folks are during these periods. Second, this is really, you know, I, can't, I really can't uh, emphasize this enough. Um, taking decisive action in periods of, of major disruption is absolutely critical. Organizations that move slowly um, are, are very um, reticent to make significant changes often find that they're late to the game uh, when it's time to pivot. Uh, they often find that things like lines of credit are no longer available uh, from, from banks and other financial sources. Uh, they definitely find that liquidity in public markets uh, uh, dries up uh, quickly. I would say that that's probably the case today. If companies haven't done a debt raise uh, in the last couple of months, it's unlikely that they're going to be able to in the near-term future. Uh, this is less um, applicable, well, key supplies um, for remote work. Um, this is another one of those things. If, if you try to do things like purchase a green screen, uh, if you try to purchase um, laptops or computers for workers, 
in the last month. You, you know, I think everyone would recognize um, supply is very, very constrained. Um, then the last couple, um, capacity contingency sites, less of an issue for the, uh, for the current business disruption. Uh, it was definitely an issue for us uh, when it was a localized geographic issue. Uh, and this issue around supply chain disruption, uh, you need to work very, very quickly to understand and assess where you have critical supply chain risks uh, and shore those up and find alternative uh, suppliers. We'll talk more about that, but this may be, you know, this along with the liquidity discussions that we're having uh, are probably the two strategic takeaways uh, from my previous experience. Third, <clears throat> uh, really err on the side of over communication. Um, you, you, I'm sure everyone has felt this, but uh, as people are working remotely, um, a lot of that organic communication uh, it doesn't take place. And there's a lot of concern and fear, um, both from your customers, or actually across all your, your customers, your suppliers, and, um, and your employees. So focus or prioritize a really robust um, communication uh, about the status of business services, expectations for your staff, uh, services and support for team members, uh, and support for priority customers during this time. Uh, you may want to have a little bit of a white glove uh, approach for really strategic customers. Uh, the other thing that you want to be careful of, though, is while you're communicating and working to be very, very clear, just be really conscious of the net effect of all of your communications. Uh, what we found was that hourly, bi-hourly, even a couple of times a day updates um, quickly grew sale uh, when there wasn't new information. Um, and there was just a little bit of a, of a communication overload. So just be thoughtful, listen to your team members, maybe do a little bit of surveying um, to just get feedback from your remote um, staff during this time so you can really dial in your communication efforts. Next. Uh, I love the, the concept of measure twice at once. Uh, we need to be decisive, but while we're being decisive, be deliberate in how and where you scale back on strategic and discretionary investments. Um, just some lessons learned. Review your contracts, right? Oftentimes, you'll, you'll go through the broad brush and cancel lots of initiatives and lots of investments, only to find later that you actually didn't have an out clause, that you're legally uh, obligated. Um, in some of those areas. So as you're bringing your people together and being really, really responsive, make sure you do a, a, a careful look through um, of those areas where you actually don't have much fungibility. Second, um, be thoughtful about cutting efforts where the vast majority of the work is already complete. So if you're 75, 80% uh, done through a strategic effort uh, and you can kind of push through the, the next quarter, we'd really recommend that you know, where possible, uh, you just push through. Third uh, is be deliberate about investment changes uh, as they relate to your strategic priorities and customer um, commitments throughout the year. Those are the ones that uh, ideally you, know, you will cut last. Um, unfortunately, uh, they often are your largest, and so that's going to be needed, but make sure as you consider making cuts there that you bring your portfolio managers in, your project managers, your business sponsors, and understand the implications of where you should cut and uh, perhaps where you should be uh, a little more deliberate about your approach. Nothing is better than a little Snoopy in a presentation. And uh, unfortunately, this isn't, a great, this isn't great news. Uh, what we've seen in past disruptions is you know, plan on not getting paid by a large um, percentage of your customers and your partners. As everyone is uh, working to address liquidity issues, um, contractual obligations are often not honored. Um, and you really need to be um, discounting expectations around cash flow and account receivables. Um, and then take a relationship view to interactions with your delinquent customers, right? So understand they're going through the same challenges that, uh, that your organization is and have a balanced view in how you engage with them during this period around outstanding AR. There's two more. Uh, one is, you know, account and solve for varying levels of remote capabilities. Uh, we've all seen this. There are folks who have, uh, you know, lower bandwidth at home than we're used to. There are folks who are wrestling with load sharing. 
uh, and where possible, uh, you know, think about providing them with some different solutions. So if it's uh, you know, you know, mobile network access, if it's access to higher bandwidth that can be funded uh, through the company during the period of the disruption, uh, and the virtual collaboration solutions, even computing, if you can get your hands on, uh, on more modern laptops. Um, those are all things that you should consider and make sure to kind of reach out and engage your, your customers on or sorry, your, your employees on. I think that's the last one. So why don't we um, transition to kind of the, these are those are observations from previous sessions. I think what we're really interested in is talking about the specific actions that we'd recommend that you take um, take on um, during this COVID, the COVID nineteen crisis if you haven't already. And I think Miles, um, you, you were going to walk through this session, right? Yeah, Jason, I was. Sorry, Miles. I was just wanting to jump in there. Um, thanks, thanks for that uh, that summary of some of the experiences that you've been through. I just want to take the time from a question perspective. Um, just before Miles starts taking us tactically through some of the things that we can we can um, work on and and think about slightly differently. In your experience, and and I'm I'm not sure if you managed to catch Tracy Swanepoel's uh, uh, talk on uh, from a Henley uh, perspective uh, quite recently. And she spoke about the communication context, uh, and I know that's a slide that you that you've just uh, kind of finished on. Uh, but a while ago, I think it was uh, slide number thirteen. You also spoke about robust communication within and amongst your team, and and obviously, and and maybe I'm I'm generalising a bit much here, but in the states, uh, communication or the telecommunication network is slightly more robust than than what it is in in South Africa, and in in the last talk. Um, Tracy spoke about the ways possibly that leaders can address some of the concerns that their teams might have with, with being able to communicate back. I know that uh, Miles is probably not going to cover that, but how did you cope? How did you deal with those kinds of challenges? Um, I, I know it's probably been answered uh, for the people who attended the previous call, but I think it's quite relevant here as well, you having lived through something pretty similar to this. Yeah, I mean, we had a, a different challenge. We had an infrastructure challenge in both events. So 9-11, uh, you know, if you wanted to use a cell phone, you might have just as well have kept it at home. Uh, there was no capacity, particularly uh, given that the largest cell phone towers were actually on top of the World Trade Center at the time. Uh, so that was a different situation uh, where we just had access and, and core capability challenges. Uh, during the Sandy Hurricane, uh, initially, you know, we had similar challenges where you know, networks were just overwhelmed. Some, some were, were uh, unavailable. But those discussions of, hey, you know, you have key workers, how do we make sure that they have, um, you know, proper bandwidth, proper computing? Um, this is where people and teams get really agile. All right. So, you know, make an offer um, to... Um, subsidize you know, higher bandwidth access for your uh, workers during this period. It's a small price to pay for a two yep. to three month uh, period. Yep. And then as you think through what are some other creative solutions in terms of mobile hotspots uh, and, and other opportunities, um, you, you'll have to do a cost benefit analysis on those. But certainly for uh, resources that are provide, providing support for um, you know, strategic accounts, and customers, or they're providing uh, real-time you know, customer support or sales support, uh, it's likely worth it. So I think those are the, the two things that, that we saw was get creative, um, be thoughtful, uh, invest. Uh, and I think it's just as important in this uh, communications discussion is ask a lot of questions. I think a lot of organizations get into push mode when they're in crisis uh, and there's, when there's disruption and they forget to pause. Uh, and survey both their customers and their employees and just validate what's working and what's not so they can have really targeted solutions. Thanks, Jason. Uh, yeah, it's, it's important having, having been through similar situations for, for us to understand that you do get through the other side. Obviously, um, it's not going to be a V or a U dip um, in, in the way that we're going to handle this, but um, thanks, thanks for your insights. Uh, Miles, I don't see that there are any other questions that have popped up in, in the Q&A box. 
So I'm going to hand over to you to take us into the short-term strategies and tactics. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Chad, and thanks, Jason. And uh, for those of you who know me, I, I tend to go off the ranch a little bit every now and again. So um, I'm going to I'm going to continue with the uh, with the with the presentation. But I also just wanted to maybe touch on a on a few of my thoughts. Uh, I was actually interviewed by uh, one of the companies, believe it or not, from Brazil uh, earlier this week, um, and they were asking me my views about you know some of the things that were going to happen and. I think the first thing that we're talking about, and I'm going to talk about short term here as well, um, is is the immediate reaction for many companies is the cut and you know the shock and cut reaction. Wow, this the, our world has fallen apart, so we we need to cut uh, as many employees out of the system as possible. We need to stop our supply chain. We need to you know really just almost like a scorched earth policy. Um, and, and that has been the reaction of many organizations in the past. But I have to say that to an extent, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm reading the wrong news channels, but from a South African context, I've actually seen a very mature approach to, from a lot of the companies. I'm, you know, I'm seeing companies like, I think it's like Woolworths and I think Vodacom and, and some of the other companies where the leaders are following, you know, President Cyril Ramaphosa's lead. And, you know, taking a 30% pay cut so that they don't have to impact their employees so much. Uh, I'm seeing, uh, you know, uh, uh, mobile companies like C and Vodacom, I'm not sure if NTN has done it yet as well, that are starting to give free access to websites that are, that are you know, used a lot during a crisis um, and not charging any, any bandwidth for that. So, so they, you know, there, there's some real positive things that are coming out of there. The other side of it, when we talk about, um, um, you know, the remote working, I think a lot of us, especially most of us that are on this webinar today, we, we're more than likely the fortunate ones and that we sit in a, in, in, in most probably a reasonably comfortable house. Yes, we're starting to, you know, I think, I don't know who barks the, who barks the quickest at a car going past my dogs or me now, but, um, you know, it, you, you start going a little bit stir crazy, but at least I have a comfortable house I can sit in um, I've got a uh, really great bandwidth. Now we talk about social distancing and, and working from home where most of our population in South Africa don't have that access. They don't have great places to do social distancing. There's a lot of people that live in shacks um, and there's you know, no running water to, to do. And we've got to, we've got to take cognizance of that. And I, I'm thus far very impressed with the South African uh, um, um, you know, a big employers in, in the way they've reacted. Yes, there's people that are taking advantage of the situation and, and inflating their prices, but they're getting caught out very quickly. So I think, you know, from that perspective, but the other thing that I was talking about with the guys from, from Brazil was, um, and I'm wondering about this. So it's just, I, I always think about the impacts of these types of things is, and, and I bet if, I, if, if there's anybody listening from, <laughs> from President Trump's uh, cabinet, they must probably be, be shooting me right now. But I have a, I have a strong feeling that we're going to start seeing a, a bigger emergence of, of China as a, as a big trade partner over and above what they already are, because they're coming out of this crisis uh, sooner than, than, than a lot of the rest of the world. Um, and then you're also having, you know, the threats like we have now with, with President Trump taking away... Uh, I don't know why I'm calling him president. Why don't we just say Trump take away $450 million away from the World Health Organization? Um, you know, I'm not sure that that's the greatest tactics uh, to be going through when we have been through a period of, of national, you know, strategies in, in various countries. But yeah, so I went off the ranch a little bit there, but so maybe just move on to the next uh, next slide, uh, Chad, uh, whoever's driving it. Um, and really, yeah, so... So will the world ever be the same again from, uh, you know, where we, where we working, uh, we working remotely. Um, so a lot of people are saying, well, yeah, well, you know, we, we, we're proving that, that we can work remotely. Uh, we proving in many instances that we can do some sort of virtual delivery, depending on what industry you're in. And therefore, what is the, why would we want to be going back to, to offices, et cetera, after uh, COVID-19, um, you know, are we going to see a much bigger move towards remote working? I guess there's two sides to that. Yes, I think we will see a much bigger move 
which is a is a good thing in certain respects because I think in those uh, those cities where traffic is a problem, we're seeing people spending two hours a, a, at least two hours a day in the traffic, and there could be a lot lot more productivity if they weren't doing that. Again, taking into account that not everybody could work from home. Um, we, but but there are again on the on the flip side of that, the the employers have in many instances entered into long term leases uh, with uh, their office spaces, so they can't just suddenly say, okay, well we're now going to take away sixty percent of our offices because they enter those long term leases. Or you seeing big, uh, you know, if you if you're in the Johannesburg region and you look at the Santon skyline and you see these massive uh, new uh, uh, multi-billion rand buildings that are recently being built. Uh, does it make economic sense actually to move everybody virtually uh, and, and remote working as possible? So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. I think there will be a lot more remote working going forward. But in terms of that, um, you know, let's make sure that we have the tools in place to manage that. I'm, I'm hearing and I don't know about, uh, I'd, I'd imagine a lot of the people on this webinar are experiencing similar things because we've actually got so many meetings every day now. Um, and it's quite tiring spending, at, you know, seven or eight hours a day in, in virtual meetings because when you're in a, in a physical meeting, you actually have time to go sit and have a coffee, uh, do a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, socializing. Whereas here it's like eight hours of just strict, you know, meeting time. And so it takes it out. And also people don't realize it, but you are being impacted. I know, I mean, our team at Be Agile, we've been working really hard over the last two weeks. And I just yesterday, I actually had to apologize to my teammates because I was getting really ratty with them. And, um, and it, it, I, I realized that it wasn't so much them as the fact that I'm sitting at home fairly locked up <laughs> and and again, very very fortunate to be locked up in in a, in a nice place. But you know, I think we need to take account of those impacts on people and realize how we're going to do this remote working. It's not just the easy transition, um, and and it could be also from a cost effective perspective, not necessarily the right one at the moment. So we're going to have to play that carefully. Uh, next slide, please, Chad. Hey, Jay. Okay, of course, money, we saw that in the survey, everybody is worried about cash flow. Um, and and it, I, would, I would have been very surprised if that wasn't the top one. Um, so, you know, have a look at, at how this is going to impact you. Have a look at your runway. How long have you got money for? And we sent out, a, in terms of the, the, the tools we sent to you, there's one called the Corporate Survivability Canvas, which you can see a small snapshot at the bottom. You know, use that just, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a one-page tool, but a lot of the tools that we use in this environment, particularly from a strategic perspective, whilst they look simple on the, on the outside, the, the, the work and the thought that needs to go into them is, is really detailed and really impactful um, and deep. So use that tool and start talking, you know, how, how long have we got money in hand for? How long can we last before we most probably need to make some really big decisions um, going forward in terms of are we going to, you know, uh, 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 retrain staff and hopefully there's very few of the, that that happens, but let's be realistic. It's most probably going to be more than we want. Um, and then also again, you know, looking at, at, at how, uh, you know, we've got that, that picture here, cash is king definitely, but liquidity is critical. We can't, we can't operate without the liquidity and you already starting to see, I don't know if any of you have noticed, but, you know, whenever I opened up my online banking profile, I was being offered loans left, right, and center. Well, now open up your banking profile and see if those loans are still available to you. More than likely not. Um, there's one or two, but I, 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 I looked for it on purpose, not because I wanted the loan, but to see what banks were doing. But all of a sudden, that wasn't there. Um, and then definitely a targeted action plan is what you're going to do when, when are you going to make the right decisions? And we in our in, in our in our agile consulting we often talk about servant leaders but we also need to start talking about situational leadership here and and our leaders of our businesses are going to have to take some tough decisions in the next few months and nobody tougher than presidents of of, of countries you know I, I, I 
my personal politics aside, I even feel sorry for, for Donald Trump having to make the decision because is the decision we open the country for business and potentially we have more deaths or vice versa, the chances are that whatever decision you make, you've got a very good chance of getting it wrong. Um, but we need those big decisions to be made. We need to be brave and we need to go forward. But, but really have a look at, your, at your, your liquidity and see how long you can sustain the business. Because the, the title of this talk is Survive and Thrive. And we really believe that that can be. So yeah, next one, please. Thanks, Miles. I see we've got some questions coming in, so we'd like cool. to leave some time at the end for, for those. Okay, cool. Uh, so we've spoken about, uh, you know, the managing online again, um, you know, your, your, your strategy, your uh, reporting, your workforce information, you know, make sure that you've got all of the tools that you have available to you, that your leaders have that in real time. Um, we know that there's, you know, there's, there's, because a lot of people are working from home that the cyber security part of that is potentially a little bit more difficult, but people still need to manage. I um, mean, do some scenario modeling and brainstorming tools, again, in the set of stuff that we sent you, you know, there's a, there's a simple uh, scenario canvas. Okay. All right, so I think again with customers, um, you know, keep them, keep them updated. Uh, we, we, we've spoken about this. I'm not really gonna spend too much more there. Um, but just make sure that your your customers, you you're going to need those customers now and into the future. So make sure a that you keep the customers you have, and b start targeting those customers that you're wanting to bring into the fold because there's going to be opportunity for you to start moving those customers towards you. Okay. All right. I think uh, Jason also mentioned this. I think one of the things we don't take account of is the supply chain. Um, the way that you treat your supply chain and your suppliers right now will have a, a short, medium and long term impact. And what do we mean by that is that if you suddenly are ruthless with your suppliers now, understand that when, when we kick back into our economic progress and growth and whatever it is, suddenly those same suppliers are going to be inundated with orders. And they are obviously going to prioritize those companies that treated them the best. So if you're going to be, uh, you know, a cowboy on how you treat your suppliers right now, understand that that's actually going to come back potentially and bite you. Okay. Yeah, we spoke about the scenario. So we don't know how long this is going to be. Uh, you know, people are making assessments and, and discussions. I was talking to a colleague in Norway today, um, and they're sending the, the young kids back to school next week. He's not worried about the young kid going back to school, but he's worried about is his old mother that lives with him because even though the kid might not catch COVID-19, the kid will be a, a carrier when they come back from the from school and you know then the, the older people in the household are actually a potential risk. So you know we, we need to understand that um, we've got to build these scenarios. We did send you the scenario map, start building robust scenarios. We know that many big organizations already do this type of stuff and you know it might be well, this is all self-evident, but some are not doing it. And that's, again, why we're saying don't do the, the, the you know, the, the shock and cut. So, you know, think about these things logically and say, okay, how do we survive the threats and how do we thrive on the opportunities? Okay. Yeah. And again, your the world won't ever be the change. Uh, we won't ever be the same again. So you're going to have to reevaluate your strategy you're going to have to look at how, again, how to survive and thrive through this period. Understand that the world, look at your new markets, look at the markets that are going to be created through COVID-19. Look at those markets that are most probably going to have less impact. So if you're in the airline industry, you're most probably going to see a big consolidation there. I, I read today that the government's already said to SAA, we're not extending you any more money. Um, and, and so those types of organizations that, have been a, a, a albatross around our neck need to just you know die a natural death now um, and so we're going to see a consolidation there we're going to see a lot i believe a lot less business travel um uh you know i, I 10 years ago i was it was a, a client in canada and i flew four days to do a half day meeting absolutely crazy so we're going to see a lot less of that um but again you know make sure that your strategy is reviewed in line with with the changes that are happening and there's opportunities don't Look at the glass half empty scenario. Look at it, the glass half full. 
Yeah. Yeah. Just so I come from an HR background uh, originally before I moved into strategy and, and, and agility. And um, so I'm a people person. Um, again, similar to how you treat your supply chain, uh, the way that you treat your employees in the next few months um, will, will, will either put you in good stead or leave you short of great talent in the future. Um, because employees will remember how you treat them now, not only if you treat them, but their friends and their families, and it will all be in the press. So make sure that whatever decisions you make, we know that there's going to be companies that have to make tough decisions, but make the decisions, but understand that the way that you do that, be empathetic, act with compassion, and, and try your best to, you know, um, not make the impact that harsh on them. Um, but, but we need to ensure that, you know, at the end of the day, if the business goes under whilst being compassionate to employees, that's most probably no good for anybody at the end of the day as well. But, you know, think about your employees and customers first, etc. Great. Um, yeah, so last slide I want to really talk to you at this stage before we go into to the questions and the closes. You know, I love this slide, uh, Winston Churchill, never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, how are you responding to, to the crisis? How are you looking at it? Um, you know, what are your competitors doing? When you're looking at competitors as well, for those of you who haven't looked at it, have a look at Simon Sinek's work where he talks about the infinite mindset because understand that your competitors, if you're, a, if you're an ad bank, your competitors not necessarily absa. Your competitors are those fintechs you don't even know about that are coming for your for your lunch. Uh, you know the guys at, uh, at uh, Jeff Bezos at Amazon says is your profit margin is my opportunity. Um, so you know have a look at that. Understand your suppliers and what they're going through and try and you know build that ecosystem relationship with them. What shifts are happening in your industry? And then lastly, what we talk here about how to become a transformational company. One of the tools that we send to you is you know, your transformational company index. Have a look at that. What we will do is also after this is send you, um, it's, it's called a transformational company uh, uh, a workbook, which literally, you know, is going to help you think about these things differently um, at the end of the day. Yep. So I think, yeah. So these are the next steps in calls to action, but let's maybe take the questions first and then we can close off with the next steps in calls to action. Thanks, Miles. Um, some some great points there, and and tying back to some of the the concerns and and uh, um, problems that Jason identified earlier. One of the questions that popped up from uh, from Travis is that uh, are we as a country, being South Africa, really doing enough stimulus to SMMEs, uh, support for retrenchment of employees? Are we actually allowing businesses to survive in the, in this pandemic? Are we doing enough and are we thinking, is the balance right between um, protecting the people or protecting the economy? Yeah, it's a, it's a, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift that a little bit for a second. Time will tell. Um, so I think that, that the South African government is doing the best it can with the limited resources it has at its disposal. I think obviously there's always better stuff that one could do. Um, but we're seeing, for example, the, the Reserve Bank uh, yesterday, again, you know, 1% uh, cut in the, in the interest rate. They're also releasing a lot more money into the fiscus so that banks have more liquidity, which allows the banks to give clients more liquidity. Um, you know, there is obviously the unemployment insurance fund available for those uh, employees that are, 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 are uh, you know, retrenched or on furlough. The, the, prob the problem with that is not all organizations pay that UIF over. Um, I think some of the social problems that are being highlighted as social problems we always knew existed. And I'm really praying and hoping that we don't forget about them once COVID-19 has to some extent uh, been resolved. And I'm talking about things like uh, the unemployment rate, things like uh, running water, things like you know, a family of 20 sharing, uh, sorry, 20 families sharing a, a latrine, um, you know, things like that. So I think that the, the homelessness that we suddenly, suddenly we can find place for the homeless people to stay. So I'm hoping that, that this, uh, I am the forever optimist. I'm really hoping that some of these 
lessons that we're being harshly uh, learning through this process actually leads to a better South Africa. The way we've responded right now as a country, I think has been, I'm proud to be South African and really think that we've responded pretty well as a, a government, a business and a nation. Whether we lose our sense of humor after, let's say, the, the uh, lockdown gets extended way into May or June or whenever it is, that's when we're really going to be able to see our metal as a country. But I think so far we've, we've got the right programs in place. I think quite often it's the access to some of those programs that are, that are being hampered. Um, and, and remember, we also live with a legacy of service delivery being really poor over the last 15 years since, uh, you know, and, and obviously with the current government trying to sort that out. But, you know, we've, we've got legacy issues we have to deal with, like the SASA scenario, um, et cetera. Yeah, and I don't think, you know, they're not new to us, uh, but it certainly has sharpened the edge on that particular sword and, and we need to address those. Thanks, Miles. I'm going to move over to a question from Tess who asks, uh, and basically it's around the um, the dependency that we had on China previously. Um, and, and do you feel that the rest of the world is going to continue to rely on China or do we feel um, that we rely on China as heavily as, as, as we had previously in the post-COVID world. You mentioned earlier that uh, China is recovering faster um, and, and they're going to be racing ahead as far as their economic strength uh, is concerned. What is, your, what is your perspective, Jason? Maybe you can pick that answer up. I think obviously um, being, being in, in the States, uh, there's been a lot of noise regarding China and, and the trade concerns. How do you see that unfolding? Yeah, it definitely has. Uh, it's, it's interesting because I, I think at the macroeconomic level, that's already been happening. Um, China you know, is no longer um, the cost leader in a lot of industries. So you start to see um, companies like Vietnam, uh, the Philippines, Indonesia, making inroads into a number of the industries that China was really dominant in uh, five to, to eight years ago. So I think the diversification of global supply chains um, has already kind of been underway. But my, my sense would actually be that um, this will accelerate some of that diversification. And we'll start looking at supplier risk um, at, at more of a macro level uh, perspective. It's no longer, you know, what, what companies do you have a lot of concentration risk? It, it may also be which, which areas or which region, regions of the world uh, do we have crippling um, supply and chain risks. Uh, an example of that is uh, the vast majority of the material that is used to make surgical masks in the United States, uh, 90 plus percent comes from China and Taiwan. And both countries uh, have stopped exporting those supplies in the last six weeks. So, yeah, um, yeah, yeah absolutely, Jason. So, near shoring. Um, is something that I think a, a lot of company uh, countries actually need to consider and and um, aggressively pursue uh, to overcome some of these challenges. Sorry to interrupt you. No, not at all. And I, I think um, some of those challenges exist elsewhere too. I, I know in the United States, a, a really high percentage of our lower cost medicine is all produced in Puerto Rico, which is really um, vulnerable to, to uh, seasonal storms. So I think that discussion of diversification across your supply chain um, is certainly going to get more interesting. Uh, I think Miles's perspective on the influence of China uh, in Africa, as an example, he may very well be right. Uh, coming out of this, yeah. US, European countries, um, maybe leaning um, less forward um, in some of, the, uh, you know, some of their policies in Africa and, and shoring up domestically. So it will be interesting to see China's role in Africa over the next five years as a result of this. Thanks, Jason. I think you can move on to the next step slide. Um, I think we've, we've covered the questions that have popped up. I don't see any others, but there is a, a question slide to wrap up with. So if there is anything else, please drop a question. Yeah, so Miles, you want to go, Jason? Yeah, so I think, you know, we, we again sent out these tools other than the, than, the, than the survey. So one of the tools we sent out was what we call the Be Agile COVID-19 Crisis Center Canvas. Um, it's just really, it's not, a, comp, it's not a, a full checklist of everything you should be thinking of, but it gives you some thoughts of 
areas where you may not have thought about before. Um, and, and obviously you have, then you can say, well, we, you know, we're doing a reasonably good job of managing this. And, you know, I think a lot of bigger organizations would have already set up these crisis centers. Um, but if you haven't, there's some ideas there to, to have a look. So that was part of the, the, the pack you would have received um, before the, the webinar. Um, then, then two is the, uh, the survey. So what we'll do is we'll send, uh, we've got the here uh, pop name company and email address into chat, but there wasn't that yet chat box. So what we're gonna do is everybody that, and if you hopefully you don't mind, that is uh, part of this webinar, we'll send the survey out to. Um, it literally is a, a, a 30 question survey that covers things like finance, uh, people, suppliers, uh, your leadership uh, strategy um, and if you if you go into it it's very quick and easy to do literally shouldn't take you more than 15 or 20 minutes and we'll come back to you then with a consolidated report to the findings of that uh, before the end of, 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 of next week um, with some recommended uh, options on how to address some of these things uh, then we've got the canvases that we that we have sent to you which we had included in the set uh, set of documents we sent you so we've got the survivability canvas that I referred to earlier on. We've got a really great one called the industry shifts map, which you can have a look at with your teams, the scenarios, the why do you need to transform the transformational index. And please, if, you, if there's anything else that you're wanting to be exploring in terms of your strategy, um, please reach out to us, uh, you know, things on innovation, on strategy itself. We have so many other great canvases that we use that we can send on to you. And also, if you need any help that you're going through these, just please reach out to us, which is you know, the, the next point, uh, which is reach out to our team. Um, you know, at, the, at this stage, we're doing uh, you know, a lot of the stuff where in, in, in helping uh, businesses. We're doing this uh, from a, a, a pro bono perspective uh, right now because we know that there's a lot of people that are out there that are really struggling, and we just also want to be giving back to our clients and customers and, and, and community um, as much as we possibly can. Thanks, Miles. Awesome. Uh, we've covered all the questions that are in the Q&A box. Uh, as you can see here, there are several ways to get in touch with us. Uh, you can email us at contact at beagile.co.za. You can go through to our website. Uh, you can also call us on the mobile and uh, that QR code will take you through to the website as well. Uh, gentlemen, Jason, Miles, thank you very much for your time. And, uh, and Barry, I'm going to hand over back to you.